NASA Personal Trainer Practice Test Series. Question 1. What best describes maximal oxygen consumption? A. The difference between resting and maximal oxygen utilization. B. Level of stress an activity puts on the body. C. Excessive training that results in severe fatigue. D. The highest rate of oxygen use and transportation achieved during maximal physical exertion. Correct answer, D. Maximum oxygen consumption is the highest rate of oxygen use and transportation that is achieved during maximal physical exertion. It is not always practical to measure VO2 max because of equipment requirements, time involved, and willingness of client to perform at maximal physical capacity. Therefore, submaximal tests, such as the YMCA 3-minute step test, are often the preferred method to calculate appropriate training intensities. Question 2. What is the purpose of using the heart rate reserve, HRR, method, also known as the Carvanen method? A. To determine the amount of time someone should spend doing a particular exercise. B. To determine training intensity based on the difference between someone's predicted maximal heart rate and resting heart rate. C. To determine what level or stage of training to start a client at. D. To determine exercise intensity during training. Correct answer, B. The purpose of using the heart rate reserve method is to determine training intensity based on the difference between someone's predicted maximal heart rate, MHR, and resting heart rate, RHR. Choosing a predetermined target heart rate, THR, is the most widely utilized and accepted way of establishing training intensity. The following formula describes how to calculate this value. Question 3. If during the overhead squat assessment, your client's feet turn out, what are the probable overactive muscles? A. Tensor fasciality, TFL. B. Hip flexor complex. C. Lateral gastrocnemius. D. Erector spiny. Correct answer. C. If your client's feet turn out during a squat assessment, it is likely that your client has an overactive lateral gastrocnemius. Other muscles that may be overactive include the soleus and biceps femoris, short head. Some stretches that could be used to correct this problem include self-myofascial release and static stretching of the gastrocnemius and soleus. Question 4. If during an overhead squat assessment, you notice that your client's lower back arches, what is one of the probable underactive muscles? A. Hip flexor complex. B. Gluteus maximus. C. Latissimus dorsi. D. Sternocleidomastoid. Correct answer, B. The gluteus maximus is one of the probable underactive muscles if your client's lower back arches during an overhead squat assessment. Other underactive muscles could include the hamstring complex and intrinsic core stabilizers. Possible ways to correct this problem include self-myofascial release and static stretching of the quadriceps, latissimus dorsi, and hip flexor complex. Question 5. What percentage of adults is affected by musculoskeletal lower back pain? A. 16% B. 33% C. 70% D. 80% Correct answer, D. Nearly 80% of all adults experience lower back pain often due to long periods of time spent sitting in enclosed workspaces or from performing manual labor. 
musculoskeletal pain commonly leads to muscular dysfunction and, consequently, injuries. Question 6. During peak exertion, the maximum rate of oxygen use and transport, a measure of cardiorespiratory fitness, is known as what? A. VO2 max. B. METS. C. SV. D. ATP. Correct answer, A. VO2 max is the maximum rate of oxygen use and transport and measures card respiratory fitness level. Though very difficult to test accurately, the Rockport Walk Test and the YMCA 3-Minute Step Test are good estimates of a client's VO2 max. Question 7. What is a systematic way of observing a client's structural and functional status? A. Diagnose conditions. B. Perform nutritional counseling. C. Fitness assessment. D. Variable selection. Correct answer, C. A systematic way to observe a client's structural and functional status is a fitness assessment. This is a method of observation and data gathering by which the health and fitness professional can determine the specific exercise needs of a client. Question 8. What type of information is provided by a fitness assessment? A. Information on medical history and health issues. B. Information about activity level, hobbies, and abilities. C. A representation of the client's goals and needs. D. All of the above. Correct answer, D. Types of information provided by a fitness assessment are information about medical history, health issues, previous injuries of conditions, habits and hobbies, and an overall representation of the client's needs and goals. This allows the health and fitness professional to craft an individualized plan for the client. Question 9. Which of the following tasks is not one that a health and fitness professional should perform for the client? A. Use exercise to help client improve overall health. B. Provide general information on health eye nutrition and diet. C. Prescribe diets and specific supplements. D. Identify potential health risks through a thorough screening process. Correct answer, C. A task that is not one that a health and fitness professional should perform for the client is to prescribe specific diets and supplements. Guidance may be provided on general dietary requirements. But for a specific diet plan, the client should be referred to a dietitian. Question 10. Which of the following is subjective information derived from a fitness assessment? A. Body composition. B. Occupation. C. Postural assessment. D. Card respiratory assessment. Correct answer, B. Occupation is subjective information derived from the fitness assessment. The other answer choices are objective and are data that can be actually measured in some way. Question 11. What is the purpose of the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire, or PARQ? A. Helps to detect cardiorespiratory dysfunction. B. Provides insight into movement capacity. C. Determines how active or lazy the client may be. D. Helps to measure any injury risks from repetitive movements. Correct answer, A. The purpose of a The Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire, or PARQ, 
is to identify from the very start of training a client whether or not there is evidence of card respiratory dysfunction. Question 12. What type of chronic lifestyle habit can lead to tight hip flexors and potentially result in postural imbalances? A. Lifting heavy objects with poor form. B. Standing with slouching posture. C. Wearing high heels. D. Sitting for long periods of time such as at a desk for work. Correct answer, D. A chronic lifestyle habit that can lead to tight hip flexors and potentially result in postural imbalances is sitting for long periods of time, such as at a desk for work. Long-term sitting can also result in shoulder fatigue, which leads to the rounding of the shoulders. Question 13. Which chronic occupational postural habit can lead to tightness in the gastrocnemius and psoas? A. Wearing high-heeled shoes. B. Long-term sitting, like at a desk. C. Repetitive movements. D. Postural imbalances. Correct answer, A. A chronic occupational postural habit that can lead to tightness in the gastrocnemius and solus is wearing high heels. The foot is placed in plantar flexion for extended periods, leading to this tightness, which can then lead to significant postural imbalances. Question 14. Of what importance is it to the health and fitness professional to learn information about a client's hobbies and recreational activities? A. Helps to reveal possible dysfunctions. B. Knowing these facts allows individualization of an appropriate training plan to those specific lifestyle activities. C. Provides insight into levels of mental stress. D. Gives insight into the capacity for movement and also the frequency these movements are performed throughout the day. Correct answer, B. It is important to the health and fitness professional to learn information about a client's hobbies and recreational activities in order to allow individualization of an appropriate training plan to those specific lifestyle activities. The training plan needs to optimize exercises helpful to the client's recreational habits to help prevent injury during these activities. Question 15. Which of the following past injuries can lead to a decrease in neural control of the patella? A. Ankle sprains. B. Lower back injuries. C. Knee injury involving ligaments. D. Shoulder injuries. Correct answer, C. A past injury that can lead to a decrease in neural control of the patella is a knee injury involving ligaments. This type of injury prevents adequate stabilization of the patella by the related muscles. Question 16. Which of the following past injuries can lead to a decrease in the neural control of stabilizing core muscles? A. Ankle sprains. B. Lower back injuries. C. Shoulder injuries. D. Groin strains. Correct answer, B. A past injury that can lead to a decrease in the neural control of stabilizing core muscles is a lower back injury. This type of injury can result in instability in the spine, leading to further dysfunction of the limbs. Question 17. Unless appropriate rehabilitation occurred, which of the following conditions can lead to postural and joint dysfunction? A. Chronic conditions. B. Medication. C. Obesity. D. Past surgeries.
Correct answer, D. Unless appropriate rehabilitation occurred, the condition that can lead to postural and joint dysfunction is past surgery. Surgeries can affect the body in a manner similar to previous injuries if not rehabilitated, causing inflammation, neural deficiency, weakness, and dysfunction. Question 18. Which of the following is not a chronic condition? A. Cardiovascular disease. B. Obesity. C. Plantar facetus. D. Diabetes mellitus. Correct answer, C. Plantar facetus is not a chronic condition, but a previous injury. The other conditions are considered to be chronic or long-term conditions. Question 19. Which of the following is the effect that beta blockers have on heart rate and blood pressure? A. Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. B. Increased heart rate, decreased blood pressure. C. Decreased heat rate, decreased blood pressure. D. Decreased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Correct answer, C. The effect that beta blockers have is to decrease heart rate and blood pressure. It is important for the health and fitness professional to know this in order to understand possible physiological effects that may result and affect the client's ability to perform certain activities. Question 20. What is the best method for the client to determine their resting heart rate? A. Check their heart rate upon waking for three mornings in a row and take the average. B. Make an appointment to visit their healthcare provider for readings. C. Compare heart before and after strenuous physical activity. D. Calculate it based on body temperature and number of calories consumed the previous day. Correct answer, A. The best method for the client to determine their resting heart rate is to check their heart rate upon waking for three mornings in a row and take the average. This can be performed using the radial or carotid pulse. Question 21. What is the average resting heart rate for a male and for a female? A. Heart rates vary and there can be no average. B. 75 BPM, 80 BPM. C. 75 BPM, 70 BPM. D. 70 BPM, 75 BPM. Correct answer, D. The average resting heart rate for a male is 70 beats per minute, BPM, and 75 beats per minute, BPM, for a female. Question 22. Which of the following is a normal blood pressure measurement? A. Diastolic of 120 to 130 mm Hg and systolic of 80 to 85 mm Hg. B. Systolic of 120 to 130 mm Hg and diastolic of 80 to 85 mm Hg. C. Diastolic of 100 to 120 mm Hg and systolic of 140 to 160 mm Hg. D. Systolic of 100 to 120 mm Hg and diastolic of 140 to 160 mm Hg. Correct answer, B. A normal blood pressure measurement is systolic of 120 to 130 mm Hg and diastolic of 80 to 85 mm Hg. Blood pressure indicates the pressure produced by the heart while pumping and the minimal pressure within arteries through a full cardiac cycle. Question 23. What method is not used to determine body fat measurements? A. Skin fold caliper. B. 
ultrasound c bioelectric impedance d underwater weighing correct answer b a method that is not used to determine body fat measurements is an ultrasound body fat measurement is a very helpful tool in helping a client to determine measurable goals for their fitness program question 24 the dernan wamersley method uses which body locations a biceps triceps cervical iliac crest b biceps triceps subscapular iliac crest c triceps deltoids subscapular iliac crest d triceps subscapular iliac crest cervical correct answer b the dernan wamersley method uses the biceps triceps subscapular and iliac crest for body fat measurements these measurements should all be taken twice on the right side of the body and measured in millimeters question 25 the best location for an accurate waist measurement is where a at the narrowest point of the waist b at the widest point of the waist c 3 inches above the navel d 3 inches below the navel correct answer a the best location for an accurate waist measurement is at the narrowest point of the waist if there appears to be no place narrower than the rest measure at the navel Thank you to everyone for subscribing, rating, faving, and commenting my video and channel.